Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to this segment in our study on the book of Revelation. Well, I'd like to welcome you to the fastest 30 minutes in television. <laughs> you know, when you get to studying the Bible, time just seems to evaporate, goes by so quick. The casting down of the censor is a big deal. It marks the end of 6,000 years of intercession. Jesus has been standing in the way of the wrath of God. When he's taken out of the way, the time of wrath then comes. Now, you may recall that the casting down of the censor in Revelation 8.5 is marked by four physical phenomena. Peals of thunder, lightning, rumblings, and an earthquake. Now, it's my belief that when the censors cast down, the whole world will be in the middle of World War III, and some nuclear exchanges have taken place, but the whole world will be brought to a sudden stop by this earthquake and these physical phenomena. This earthquake will break up the surface of the earth so that travel will be almost impossible. Now, let's go to the computer screen and continue with our investigation here about this earthquake. The global earthquake in Revelation 8.5 will come as a surgical strike. In other words, God has a strategic purpose, a deliberate purpose for this earthquake. Bridges, roads, high-rise buildings, freeways, runways, Hydroelectric dams, power grids, and underground utilities will all be torn apart. God will divide earth into 144,000 small parcels. And in each parcel, one of God's servants will be found. Well, you may be wondering, how can this earthquake in Revelation 8.5 be global? since Revelation 8.5 doesn't say anything about the earthquake being global? Well, that's a good question. That's a fair question. So look at this parallel that occurs at the second coming. I'm reading Revelation 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. This voice comes from the throne. It is Jesus speaking. The seventh angel pours out his bowl, and Jesus says, It is done. The plan of salvation, all that has been given him to accomplish, is now finished. It is done. Verse 18 says, Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. Uh, you should note that we're reading Revelation 16, at the, and we're talking about the seventh bowl. We're not talking about the censor being cast down here. We're looking at a parallel, and we see the same four physical phenomenon. And the Bible goes on to say, no earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. Verse 20 says, every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. So all to, to all my friends living in the Rocky Mountains, um, goodbye. <laughs> Everything is an upheaval. It's actually torn apart. Every island. Japan. Sorry. <laughs> Everything is literally ripped apart pieces. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell on men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. This great hailstorm, these huge hailstones, at about a hundred pounds each, are on fire, and they ignite a light of, they ignite fire, a lake of fire, that burns up the earth at the second coming, but uh, part of the earth, but we'll deal with that later on when we get to that point of Revelation 16. The point here that I want you to, to see is that at the second coming we have five physical signs, 
flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake, so severe that every island, every mountain was moved out of their places, and this was followed by a hailstorm with stones weighing about 100 pounds each. Okay, we know the second coming is a global event. Moving the islands and the mountains out of their places is a global event. So let's back up now to Revelation 11, and let's look at the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, 19, Bible says, Then God's heaven, temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Okay, God is going to demonstrate a marvelous scene in heaven. And everyone who is alive at the time of the seventh trumpet is going to look up and they're going to see this with their own two eyes. Because God is going to open up heaven so that everyone can not only see his temple, but they're going to see the ark of his covenant. Inside the ark of his covenant, of course, is his ten commandments. The ten commandments of God are his covenant. The ten commandments are the covenant. And you can read that. They're called the covenant many times. Or the testimony. And when the seventh trumpet occurs, there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Well, again we find flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a hailstorm. This is a parallel of what we saw at the second coming. The seventh trumpet is also a global event. The Ark of the Covenant, which contains God's law, the Ten Commandments, will be shown to the whole world because this is the higher law which the wicked refuse to acknowledge. Global event. Global earthquake. Now look at this text. Revelation 8, 5. Then the angel took a censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it down on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. For the third time in Revelation, we find flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a hailstorm. But wait, you say, there's no hailstorm in Revelation 8, 5. That's true, but the hailstorm is mentioned in verse 7. First angel sounds his trumpet, and there came a hailstorm. A fiery hailstorm. And a third of the earth was burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. Since the end of corporate mercy concerns the whole world, what would be the point of a great earthquake in some remote part of Siberia when the censor is cast down? Did the earthquake and the tsunami that followed, that killed 250,000 people in December of 2004, affect the United States? No. Will the end of corporate mercy affect every living person on earth? Yes. Therefore, these signs and wonders that we're studying are global. The book of Revelation is just as pertinent and just as relevant in Moscow, Jerusalem, Sydney, Australia, as it is in Washington, D.C., or Seattle, Washington. Well, what have we learned thus far? We know the censor hasn't been cast down because there is no historical event that meets the specifications given in Revelation 8, 5, 0. There's nothing in history that marks this event. In fact, it was widely believed by geologists that a global earthquake was impossible until 1995. But during that year, an earthquake occurred near Bogota, Colombia, South America, which was felt from top to bottom throughout the Western Hemisphere, and that one earthquake suddenly changed everyone's thinking. Then, the huge earthquake that created the tsunami in Southern Asia during December 2004, on the Richter scale was a 9.2, and it proved that a global earthquake was possible. 
because it literally shook the whole world and that earthquake even affected the rotation of our planet. So, we know the sensor hasn't been thrown down because there is no historical event that meets the specifications given in Revelation 8.5. What else do we know? Well, we know the four angels have not inflicted the harm that they've been given power to do. And they aren't allowed to hurt the earth until the 144,000 are sealed. What else do we know? We know that the harm of the first two trumpets will affect the earth, the land, the sea, and the trees. We know that as concerning the land, all the green grass will be burned up. We know from the first trumpet that a third of the trees will be burned up. And we know that the sea will, be dead, will become deadly. A great asteroid will impact the sea. A third of the ships will sink. A third of the sea will turn red like blood. And a third of the sea creatures will die. Unfortunately, these things have not happened in history. It would be wonderful if they were in the past. <laughs> but they are neither in the future. Uh, after, that is, a pre-tribulation rapture. They don't happen after a pre-tribulation rapture is what I'm saying. These events are neither in the past nor are they after a pre-tribulation rapture. They are coming soon and they will affect you and me. As you've heard me say many times, I'm very impressed with the timing of Revelation's story. After the world experiences a nuclear exchange or two, I believe the saints will all be praying on the same page. Save us, Lord Jesus. Come quickly or we will all die. And I believe the Lord will answer our prayers as man prepares to release another round of atomic power on his enemy. God releases his wrath on mankind. And all of this occurs a mere 1,335 days before the seventh millennium begins. Wow. <laughs> With God, timing is everything. Well, here's an interesting thought I want you to think about. I get this question a lot. People write to me and they say, Larry, what about Matthew 24, 22? Jesus said, quote, If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. Is he talking about the Great Tribulation or is he talking about World War III? But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Well, I think he's talking about World War III. For the sake of the elect, they're praying for deliverance. And for their sakes, I believe Jesus steps in to the affairs of man to keep man from destroying mankind. Well, this verse obviously raises a difficult question. Why would God give us the length of several time periods within the Great Tribulation only to change them? In other words, why would God say one thing in the Bible and then make the Bible inaccurate? For example, the Great Tribulation is 1,335 days in length. The work of the two witnesses is 1,260 days in length. The persecution of the saints will last 42 months. And we know the fifth trumpet is five months in length. Since Jesus is waiting for a day, that is 1,335 days from the beginning of the, great, of the seventh millennium, excuse me, do you think it's possible that Jesus could start the Great Tribulation a little early? Maintaining all of the time periods without change? that are given in prophecy because World War III breaks out? In other words, instead of waiting for the day that is 1,335 days from the beginning of the seventh millennium, is it possible that the Lord steps into World War III and the Great Tribulation begins a little earlier than planned and that would mean the saints go home a little earlier than anticipated? Well, I can't say for sure. But I can say that God reduces a number of days for the sake of his children. Jesus said they would be cut short for the sake of his elect. 
And it will be just fine with me if Jesus gets here earlier than the seventh millennium. <laughs> okay. I've covered a lot of incidental things that I felt are important uh, for you to consider. Now, I want to go back through the first four trumpets a second time because there are several things there that you need to have in your thinking. And I want you to notice three important things as we go through these trumpets. First, the seven trumpets should be considered designer judgments. <laughs> This means they have been deliberately and thoughtfully designed to say certain things to the survivors about God and His character and His law and His mercy. God is deliberate and purposeful in everything He does. These are designer judgments. And the second thing oh, you've noticed already is the repetitive use of one-third, one-third, one-third. Twelve times in the seven trumpets this quantity is mentioned. And we will discuss why it has to be this way. The third thing I want you to notice is that the language, notice that literal events produce literal results. You know, as we draw close to the fulfillment of Revelation's story, the fulfillment of prophecy um, takes less and less explanation. Because the Bible reads and says exactly what it means. And literal events produce literal results. A lot of people want to make these seven trumpets, oh, that's symbolic, that's symbolic. They want to make everything symbolic. Well, that's just a measly excuse. Those are weasel words. <laughs> weasel words, I tell you, for not being able to accept the Bible for what it says. Literal events produce literal results. So the first angel is a literal angel, and he sounds a literal trumpet. And there comes literal hail and fire mixed with blood, and it's hurled down upon the earth. And on a literal earth. And a third of the literal earth was literally burned up, and a third of the literal trees were burned up, and all the literal green grass was burned up. How much clearer does it have to get? <laughs> a man said to me one day, he said, Larry, um, you take all this and take it so literally. He said, this is all symbolic. You're just, you're not with the program here. And uh, I said to him, I said, well, if it's symbolic, what would God have to say? What kind of words would God have to use to get literal hail burning up a literal earth and literal trees and literal green grass? What kind of words would it take to get you to take this literally? <laughs> well, he just sort of... Um, Frowned and walked away. Well, I think there's all good reason for taking this very literally. Literal events produce literal results. And the rule number three says, if something is symbolic, the scripture will interpret the meaning of the symbol with relevant texts. So, the earth is literal. The trees are literal, the green grass is literal, the hail is literal, the fire is literal, the angels literal, the trumpets literal? Yes. All right. Hail and fire mixed with blood. Literal blood. Well, let's look at that. The idea of blood mixed with hail and fire is that of mercy. You've got to remember, we're talking about a censer being cast down at the altar of incense. God justifiably burns up a third of the earth. But God mercifully spares two-thirds. The idea of blood mixed with the hail there came hail and fire 
mixed with blood. And it was hurled down upon the earth. So what does this blood mean? Well, to get an explanation for this, we're going to go to Revelation 14, which promises there will be no mixture of mercy for those who worship the beast and receive his mark. Notice Revelation 14, 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. The third angel follows the first two angels. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out, how? Without mixture without mercy the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without any mercy into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb what I'm saying here is that all who receive the mark of the beast are going to drink the bitter wine of God's wrath. Now, we're not talking about symbols here. We're talking about analogies here. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if possible, take this cup from me. He was talking about the wrath of God in that cup. And this cup of the wrath of God will be poured out upon the wicked, those receiving the mark of the beast, and they will be forced to drink it. And the idea here is that they will be tormented, punished in fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Well, the parallel here is identical. Is that fire and brimstone from the first trumpet is going to fall upon the earth. But it's mixed with blood. The blood of Jesus is mixed within this judgment for the sake of human beings. It's a, there's mercy. And that's why only one third is destroyed. However, those who worship the beast and receive his mark, they will be destroyed with fire and brimstone and they will receive no mercy. It's poured out without mixture. No, no blood, atoning blood is mixed in. The wrath falls with no mercy. And that's what it says in Revelation 16 concerning the seven last bowls, the seven last plagues, that with God, with, the, with them, God's wrath is completed. Look at this, Revelation 6, 12. I watched, this is the second coming of Jesus. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. This is the great earthquake, the same one we read about in Revelation 16. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, and the whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. These falling stars are the hundred pound meteorites the hailstones that we read about in Revelation 16. At the second coming, Jesus will punish the wicked with fire and brimstone that falls from heaven. In fact, a lake of fire will be ignited at the second coming that will burn until the end of the thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, the devil and his angels will be thrown into this lake of fire. However, the wicked will be annihilated with fire and brimstone that falls from heaven after everyone has been judged, you know, and complete restitution has been extracted from the wicked. The point here is that when the first trumpet sounds, fiery hailstones will speed through Earth's atmosphere at something like 35,000 miles an hour, and these flying rocks will kill men and beasts alike. As I said earlier, thousands of notably wicked places all over the world will be set on fire, and hundreds of millions of people will be burned up. The survivors will think the gates of hell have been opened up and the end of all life has come. 
These horrible fires will sterilize notably wicked places. Then an asteroid will hit an, an ocean and huge waves of water, several hundred feet high, will wash inland for miles and notably wicked places will be washed away. Isn't it interesting how that in the first two trumpets, fire and water cleanses the earth of notably wicked places. But wait, we've got the land to clean up and the third asteroid will take care of that. All right, going back to look quickly at the second trumpet, the second angel sounded his trumpet. There's something I want you to see here. And something like a huge mountain, a huge rock, all ablaze, coming through our atmosphere, sets it on fire. And notice it says, was thrown into the sea. This is not a random event that just happens to happen. This is not just a, a chance encounter with an asteroid. The scripture says, something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown, as in deliberately thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. This trumpet describes an asteroid impact on an ocean. The asteroid will make the water anoxic, oxygen deficient in other words, and red algae, red tide will give the ocean the appearance of blood. The stench of death will be everywhere because millions of innocent sea creatures, millions of tons of innocent sea creatures will die and will wash up on the shores of the nations. Thousands of ships will sink the resulting tsunami will wash away thousands of grossly wicked places and millions of godless people living by the sea. Because the sea will remain angry and violent after this impact, global commerce will be impossible. Ships will not be able to navigate the churning water. The financial infrastructures of earth will implode. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Luke 21, 25. Well, I know the picture that I'm sharing with you is a bleak one. But can words adequately describe the wrath of God against wickedness? There's a great reluctance to call sin by its right name right now. It's not politically correct. But all this will change very rapidly, very quickly once the world beholds the wrath of Jesus. May God help us to prepare for this is my prayer.